we got seven different stories to cover from outside of the UK, guys. It's time for another episode of the World's News Round. Let's go. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Lee here with a premiere video of the World's News Round where I cover various stories from outside of the UK. And we start here with one from the Association Press with the headline that Arizona's 1864 abortion ban is officially off the books. And this is a really nice uh, story to start with, especially if you're somebody who believes in women having their rights protected in any way, shape or form. Obviously, uh, not just in Arizona, but in the in across America, many states are f uh, in many states, women are battling to try and protect their rights to be able to decide what to do with their own bodies, and they're not have and they had that rights taken away with them since the Roe v. Wade rule was was overturned by the Supreme Court, and it has been a, a devastating time for many Americans who have had to make a make travels to other states or to or to try and get their abortions cancelled um it is a very um <coughs> a difficult battle f for them and without a doubt kamala harris uh, the vice president who the vice president of the united states who is running to be the next president of the united states against donald trump has vowed to repeal uh, to bring back roe v wade and to give women the rights that they so rightly deserve because it is a woman's choice to decide what they should do with their own body however many people believe that the moment that uh that any kind of concession is made inside a woman that that baby or that infant should have rights completely ignoring the fact that the woman who did not who may or did not want that child their rights are completely ignored in all of this uh so that's really why where my position stands on this but let's read more into arizona's 1864 uh, abortion ban here guys so Arizona's Civil War era ban on nearly all abortions is officially being repealed Saturday. So that's the time of this. Uh, for those, uh, I should just point out just before I go any further. This is being recorded on the 14th of uh, 14th of September 2024. Date time of this is around 10.58am uh, on Saturday morning. So Arizona's era... Uh, Civil War era ban on nearly all abortions officially being repelled on Saturday. The Western Swing State has been uh, whipsawed over recent months, starting with the Arizona Supreme Court. It's deciding in April to let a state enforcement the long dormant 1864 law that criminalized all abortions, except when a woman's life was jeopardized, they then the state lawmaker voted on a bill to repeal the law once and for all. Democratic Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs signed the bill in May, declaring that it was just the beginning of a fight to protect reproductive health care in Arizona. I will continue to do everything in my power to protect reproductive freedoms because I trust women to make the decisions that are best for them, and I know politicians do not belong in the doctor's office, Hobbs said in a statement. Abortion has sharply defied Arizona's political area uh, since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022. As the November general election approaches, the issue remains a focus on Democratic campaigns, and it will be up to Arizona voters to decide whether to enshrine the right to abortion in the state constitution. After It was after the state Supreme Court cleared the way for enforcement that Hobbs urged the state legislator to take immediate action to undo the ban before it went into effect. Republican lawmakers who hold a narrow majority in both chambers derailed discussions about repealing the ban. And at one point, the roadblock resulted in chance of shame, shame by outraged colleagues. And yeah, I don't blame them for feeling that way. Emotions on the House floor and in the gallery ran high as House Democrats were able to gather the support of three Republicans to pass the repeal legislation two weeks later, sending the message to the Senate for consideration. Two GOP senators joined with Democrats a week later to grant final approval. Democrats were uh, advancing for repeal long before the Supreme Court issued its ruling. Even Hobbs called for her for her state, January State of the State address. The battle in Arizona made national headlines again when Democrat State uh, Senator Eva Butch told lawmakers in a floor speech in March that she was going to get an abortion because her pregnancy was no longer viable. She said in an interview that it was her chance to highlight that laws passed by legislation in Arizona actually do impact people in practice and not just in theory. In the weeks between the High Court's decision and Hobbs signing the repeal into law, Arizonans were in a state of confusion about whether their near-total ban would end up taking effect before the repeal was implemented. 
A court order put the ban on hold, but questions lingered about whether doctors in the state could perform the procedure. California Governor Gavin News uh, Newsom weighed in on the issue in late May, signing legislation allowing the Arizona doctors to receive temporary emergency licenses to perform abortions in California. With a territorial ban no longer in play, Arizona laws allow abortions until 15 weeks, and after that, there is an exception to save the life of the mother, but, uh, but missing are exceptions for cases of rape or incest after the 15-week mark. Arizona requires those seeking an abortion prior to the 15-week mark to have an ultrasound at least 24 hours before the procedure and will be given the opportunity to view it. Minors have either parental consent or authorization from a state judge, except in cases of incense when the life is at risk. Abortion uh, mediation or medication sorry, can only be provided through a qualified physician and only licensed physician can perform surgical abortions. Abortion providers and clinics also must record and report certain information about the abortion they perform to the Department of Health Service. Voters will have the ultimate say on whether to add the right to abortion to the state constitution when they cast their ballots in the general election. Arizona for Abortion Access, the coalition led leading the, the ballot measure campaign, was successful in securing the measure spot on the ballot. The Arizona Secretary of State verified 577,971 signatures that were collected as part of the citizen led campaign, well over the 383,000 required from the registered voters. If voters approved the measures, abortions would be allowed under federal viability, at which point at which a thesis could survive outside the womb, typically around 24 weeks. It would also allow abortions after that time in cases when the mother's physical or mental health is in jeopardy. And let's be clear about this, guys. Um, Donald Trump wants an outright, wants a complete and total outright abortion ban. He wants a complete outright uh, total abortion ban. Let's be very clear about this. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you've read Project 2025, some of the actions that they want to take, they want to take control of women's bodies. They really, really do. And if you are somebody who believes in women's rights, that believes that women should be able to make that decision for themselves, then if you are an American listener to this, you will vote for Kamala Harris uh, just for your very, just to be able to make that decision and conscious choice for you. Um, and Ar Arizona, just like many other states of, of our having these battles but some states obviously there are sadly women who believe that they should not be allowed to have that choice and that some some of them believe in pro-life and some of them just so generally believe that that they should have the baby that they should have the baby regardless of whatever the circumstances they come through which i think is wrong uh my, my personal opinion obviously as a as a man i just think that you know in this day and age people should be able to make the choices for themselves and that's really what it is at the end of the day it's all about choice. And people should be allowed to make that choice for themselves, you guys. The next story I've got for you guys is an exclusive from Rhetoras here. This one, uh, uh, the exclusive reveals that Russia produces kamikaze drones with Chinese engines. So we know that, um, I've talked about this quite several times, obviously. So we know that Russia does get um, some drones from Iran and uses those uh, to in, in the, the Ukraine war, obviously. Um, but um, I wasn't aware, obviously, that, that Russia was using Chinese engines. But apparently, according they are, according to this exclusive from Rhetoras, and, and they're quite a reliable source of, of, of news, Rhetoras, when it comes to information out there. And they're very much down, uh, they're very much down, I would say, down the middle when it comes to left-wing or right-wing news politics. Some people may disagree. Um, but I do, uh, but on this as well, this is uh, quite interesting that... Um, but they're using Chinese engines. And this is a case that just Russia don't have the same air. Uh, don't have the engines themselves. Let's have a read into this, you guys. So, so Russia started producing a new long-range attack drone called the Kalibra A1 last year using Chinese engines and parts which has deployed in the war in Ukraine according to two sources from a European intelligence agency and documents seen by Reuters. Excuse me. The intelligence, which include a production a contract for the new one, new drone. Sorry, I'm stomach's playing up a little bit so i do apologize the company correspondence on the manufacturing process and financial documents indicate that the iem Z kapal a subsidy of russian state-owned weapons and uh, makers arms as anthony produced more than 2500 uh i can't say that word from july 2023 to july 2024 uh galipis galipas I'm just going to call them A1 drones because they do determine them as A1 drones. The existence of the new Russian drones incorporate Chinese technology has not been previously reported. 
the IZ, IEMZ, Kapol, and Anderson only did not respond to requests for comments. Yeah, they're not going to... Don't really want to give their give anything away, I would say. The two intelligence sources said that the A1, which which means in the, which means harpy in Russian, has been deployed against military and civilian targets in Ukraine, causing damage to critical infrastructure as well, both civilian and military casualties. And we've reported numerous times with short videos here on this channel uh, some of the strikes and targets where civilians have been targeted. There was, a, I believe, a hospital or a school not too long ago that was also hit as well by Ukraine. I, I think that was more of a ballistic missile strike rather than a drone strike. They shared with veterans of what they said were images from Ukraine's wreckage of uh, Galipa without providing further details. Retro's found information that reinforced this conclusion but was unable to confirm the images independently. The sources asked uh, that neither they nor their agency be identified due to the sensitivity of the information. They have also asked for certain details such as dates related documents to be withheld. Yeah, retros are, are very good at keeping their sources close. They don't give too much away in that. And, even though you kind of want more information about a certain story, if you want to keep the sources you have, you have to respect their decisions to not reveal too much. Samuel Bendit and a Jordan senior fellow at the Center for the New American Security, a Washington DC based think tank told Reuters uh, that uh, Galipa, if confirmed, would, make, would mark a departure from Russian resign, reliance on Iranian designs for long range drones. If this is happening, this could indicate that Russia is now relying more on domestic development as well as obviously on China, since both sides of the war depend on many Chinese components for drone production, he said. Iran, which didn't comment on this story, has supplied more than thousands of Shali Kamikaze drones to Russia since the start of the invasion in February 2022, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said in May last year. They have been used to exhaust Ukrainian air defences and hit infrastructure far from the front lines. Iran has repeatedly denied sending drones for Russia for use in Ukraine. There have been multiple stories that they have. And they have continued to deny it. Russia's Defense Ministry did not respond to requests for comment on this story. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said in a statement that rhetoric, to rhetoric that Beijing strictly controls the exports of items which potentially military applications, including drones. So China are pretty much, I'm going to assume, saying they, they, don't, they are not cohesive in any of this. With regards to the Ukrainian crisis, China has always been committed to promoting peace talks and political statements. The statement said it added there has no international restrictions on China's trade with Russia. So they're not saying no and they're not saying yes. So they haven't flat out denied it either. <coughs> NATO Secretary General Jen Sockersberg last week called on China to stop supporting Russia's war in Ukraine and said Beijing's assistance had been a significant factor in the continuation of this of the conflict. The Gabriel car closely resembles the Shadow, but it has several distinguishing features, including a unique Boton Fin and a Lambrith L550E engine. The European agency in the state said in a statement to Retros, the engine was originally designed and manufactured by a German company is now produced in China by a local firm, uh, Zilin uh, Limbich. The company did not respond to a request for comment. Yeah, then again, they're not going to comment, but might as well worth asking. Retro has reviewed a contract of worth more than 1 billion rubles, that's 10 million euros, signed in the first quarter of 2023 between the Russian Defense Ministry and Kapal for the development of a factory to produce the drones. The intelligence source is, sources said that a former cement factory situated in Isles uh, Umid Republic in western Russia was purchased uh, by Kapal in 2020 is being used to produce the drones. In a video of a Russian drone production facility posted on Telegram messaging app, retourists were able to identify the site as the factory in Iliskas from the colors and designs of the building, beams and internal architecture, excuse me, which matched the file imagery of the site. The location of the file imagery was verified from nearby buildings, roads and trees that match with street views and satellite imagery. That is very clever from Retoras. That is very clever. A prototype of the Galipe was launched in the first half of 2023. Company communications showed production reached several hundred in the second half of 2023 and more than doubled than around 2,000 in the first half of 2024, the agency has said. But the defense analyst said 2,500 drones per year would, would represent a sizable chunk of Russia's output. Ukraine's top military commander, Ola Suski, said last month that Russia has fired nearly 14,000 strike drones since it invaded in February 2022, including the Iranian Shadad as well as the Russian-made Geren-2 and Langin drone. Corporate documents dated from the second quarter of 2023 reviewed by Retro showed that supplies, VSK Vector, and produced parts from Chinese companies for assembly at the Kabul site. 800 Chinese engines were, 
were also to be delivered to the new plant where the production line was ready, due to be ready by the end of the quarter. TSK Vector did not respond to a request for comment. Everyone is saying no, no, no to this. The European Intelligence Service said in a statement it was concerned that Chinese companies were continuing to buy components to enable Russia production of large kamikaze drones. The export of the essential components to Russia needs to stop, it said. Washington has warned, has repeatedly warned Beijing over its support for Russian defense industry. It has imposed hundreds of sanctions aimed at curbing Moscow's ability to export certain technology for military purposes. The State Department and the White House did not respond to requests for comment from this story. In July, China said it would tighten drone export, uh, export rules starting on the 1st of September. Beijing has said that U.S. sanctions on Chinese entities over the Ukraine court are illegal and unluteratural. I know the word, guys. I just can't say it. The Gabarivka has, take, has a takeoff weight of less than 300 kilos and a maximum range of 1,500 kilometers. The production contract between Kabul and the Russian Defense Ministry said uh, roughly similar to Iran's Shadad 136 drones is that Moscow has used extensively in Ukraine. The Washington Post reportedly in August, uh, reported in August that Russia aims to increase production of the domestic version of the Shadad 136, known as the Giran 2, at a plant in the Albania. Uh, Albona Special Economic Zone in Tarstam. Ukraine said in April it had carried out a drone strike against the drone manufacturing plant there. Uh, so this apparently so production chain of a Russian drone news in Ukraine. Russia began production of the drone last year in Galaripa factory in Iskis. So according to this so the manufacturer is from China, Chinese, and they use dual on aviation technology and Red Plus VSK Vector. Hmm, interesting. And then they, they supply it through there. This is what they're claiming, how it's done. Sanctioned and not sanctioned. Is what they're claiming here. Interesting. This was uh, September the 13th. This this was, um, uh, yeah, interesting. In Western Russia. A third document reviewed by Retro is a delivery status update between the intermediate TSK Vector and the, other manu and the manufacturer Cabal dated in the first quarter of 2024 detailed an order of over 100 axles, uh, carburetors and other Lembra engines uh, parts supplied by two of the other Chinese companies. Jardon Aviation Technology and Respus Vector Industries both based in uh, Xinjiang. General Wood was placed under British sanctions in February and US sanctions in May for providing Russia with drone equipment and Red Bull Plus did not respond for requests for comment. Customs data obtained for the commercial supplies that records and complies with the information showed that from April 2022 to December 2023, VSK Vector imported $36 million in goods from Chinese Jalog Aviation Technology and $6.2 million from Red Bull Plus VSK Vector Industry Industrial Schengen Co. Limited. According to the custom documents, the goods include aircraft engines, transitioners, electronic modules, connectors, plugs and sockets, spare parts and components, most of them marked as for general civil purpose. For general civil purpose, for general civil use. This story has been corrected to fix a typo in paragraph 8. So they claim, yeah, so inch is, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a not, it's not a guarantee but we we could assume that retros have got enough relevant information that says here, yeah, Russia are getting supplied drones and engine parts here from China in very small components, but not actually saying that this is these components. What, what China could be saying is that these are not actually specific. China could be allegedly saying is that they're not actually parts for drones, but they actually are allegedly. Um, and there's a uh, sort of thing. But this is a very interesting piece from Retros. Um, for quite a long time, I've, ne I've, not, I've not seen any concrete evidence that says that has suggested that Russia are supplying that sorry that China are supplying Russia with anything that would help them and benefit them in the war. We know that there is a strong relationship between China and Russia as well as Russia with North Korea, and we know that. Um, but both China, Russia, and all those involved have denied that there's anything going on here. However, there's not been a real comments either from 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 the United States on this, from the U.S. government on this as well. So, 
it, there could be something to this that might not be. Uh, it could be possible that behind the scenes that the US government has asked for, for the details of what Retros has as well, so that they can look into this behind closed doors off, off the record books as well, potentially. So it's it, that is an enti that's an entirely possible position to take, I would say, on this as well. Um, given that I don't really hear a lot about about this i i am gonna take take this story a little bit of a pinch of salt because obviously it's a lot it's a lot of vagueness on this because it's not 100 percent certainty yeah i think china are very very i think if china are, are if this is story is true if this story is accurate and if china are supplying engines towards a kamikaze drones that russia are producing they would be very careful to make sure that the components and parts that they provide them don't state anything chinese related on on them whatsoever uh, is what i would say but we'll try i'll try and keep my eye out on ret on retros because they do have some very good exclusives every now and then that they come up with that is for sure guys but i'm sure i'm sure it won't be the last time we talk about drones because i've mentioned drones quite a few times on the channel about the drones that russia uses when obviously it's mainly about iran which they continuously deny but now it looks like there's components and parts coming from china allegedly hmm interesting to say the least guys so completely switching gears here before we take a little funny before we take a funny break in between here on the world's news round so this one is a short one but i do think it's a um finding stories like i said in africa is very very difficult but this one from africa news i've got um is an interesting one to say the least so a court in congo hands down death sentences to 37 people on coup charges uh, so what is this about, guys? So let's read into it. So a military court in Congo has handed down sentences on uh, last Friday to 37 people, including three Americans, after convicting them on charges to participate in a coup attempt. The defendants, most of them Congolese, but also include a Briton, Belgium and Canadian, have five days to appeal the verdicts on charges that include attempting coup, terrorism and criminal association. 14 people were acquitted in the jail, which opened in June. The court in the capital, King Kaska, uh, convicted the 37 defendants and imposed the harshest penalties, that of death. In the verdict delivered by the presiding judge, uh, Madge, Freddie Imler, at an open-air uh, military court proceeding that was broadcast live on TV. The three Americans, wearing blue and yellow prison clothes and sitting in plastic chairs, appeared stout as the translator explained their sentence. Six people were killed during the botched coup uh, attempt uh, led by the little-known opposition figure Christian Malaga in May that targeted the presidential palace and a close ally of President Felix uh, Teoriski. Malaga was fatally shot while resisting arrest soon after live-streaming the attack on his social media, the Congolese army had said. Malenga's 21-year-old son, Marcel Malenga, who is a US citizen, and two other Americans were convicted in the attack. His mother, Brittany Solar, said her son is innocent and was simply following his father, who considered himself president of a shadow government in exile. The other Americans are Tyler Thompson, Jr., 21, who flew to Africa from Utah with the younger Malena for what his family believed was a vacation. Oh, his family didn't even know. Oh, man. And Benjamin Rubin Zaman Peel, 36, who is reported to have known Christian Malanga through a gold mining company. Congo reinstated the death penalty earlier this year, lifting more than two decades old mortuum as authorities struggle to curb violence and malicious attacks in the country. The country's penal code allows the president to designate the method of execution. Past execution of militants in Congo have been carried out by a firing squad. <clears throat> this is all I've got on the story. I'm not sure. I generally would like to know what, what the US, US response to this is especially when it's free uh quite a few americans there there's a britain in involved as well i generally would like to know what what america's stance and position on this but i don't know enough about this story to say whether or, to say to say to state whether or not this is right or not i am someone who is strongly against the death penalty I don't believe the death penalty is the right thing. I believe the death penalty is from a get is is to me is like a get out of jail free card uh, when it comes to 
when it comes to punishment of criminals and uh, and whatnot, I know some people think it's it's a it's a good it's a better way of dealing with 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 criminals and get uh, the most vile people in society. Uh, I generally believe that uh, throwing the most uh, heinous of people in a solitary confinement and throwing the key away and leaving them to rot is probably a better for me is a better option than giving them the death penalty. To me, I, I always see it as a get out of jail free card. To, to me, always have seen the death penalty like that. But it, it feels like to me, while um, obviously the coup that happened um, was obviously obviously troublesome. Well, we know Congo has had some lots and lots of problems, but the Americans that are involved, I mean, like for the family. Like the the family of Tyler Thompson who flew to Africa from Utah, and they believed it was a vacation, and then they find out about this. I mean, that's just I just don't know. Imagine I just can't imagine what they're going through. There, there. I'm sure there'll be more to this. Obviously, there's still a couple of days before they can. There's still a couple of days they can appeal. I'm pretty sure that they will try to appeal this, but it's pretty grim nonetheless that is for sure um this will be a hard one to keep an eye on you guys but um there's entirely possible that they, they may the appeal may come through as well um so guys we'll step away from from uh, that story we've got come up other stories to cover here on the world's news round if you haven't already please hit the like button we greatly appreciate it. please share it across social media so others are notified of uh, this video and if you haven't subscribed already please consider subscribing because it really does help support the channel i'd like to get to 2000 subscribers by the end of the year if possible so if you haven't subscribed already and you do uh, uh, find the content informative and helpful to you please click the subscribe button it really does make a massive difference if you hit the bell notification icon you'll be notified when whenever I upload videos or whenever I go live. Also, you can always check out the homepage of whenever I have live streams scheduled as well. Normally, I keep them quite updated for the week. So you can always check out of when my next live stream is. So for those who, uh, who are subscribers and don't really see uh, when I'm going live, you can check the homepage to see when my next live stream is up. So you guys can always come and join us for that. So we'll take a little break here, guys. I've got a funny video for you guys, especially if you were... There's been lots of funny videos about Trump versus Harris since the debate, obviously. Um, so let's have a little bit of fun here, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this one here uh, from these two. Um, these two are absolutely brilliant um, actors pretending to be um, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. Here I am with Kamala, by the way, who I agreed to debate because I love to debate and I'm a very good debater. I love to debate. That's debatable. Okay, very debatable. What are my thoughts on immigration? I think it's a perfectly fine question. It's a very nice question. And we're going to be doing a lot because there are people over there and there are people over here. Okay, and we want, we want, okay. Slow down, little Kamala. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> there's people they want to come into the country and there's some people they want to leave the country. And I think if they want to leave, they should leave. And if they want to come in, we should put them in jail. That is actually so inappropriate, and that is exactly what I'm talking about. They're coming from okay. outer space and Oaxaca. Okay, I'm speaking, all right? I'm the speaking. Democrats, they say the price is right, but it's very wrong. It's very wrong, and we're getting rid of prices, and we're giving away a lot. We're giving away vegetables. I'm starting a garden, a very big garden, and everyone can have a pumpkin. Okay, you know what, we're not giving, we're not doing pumpkins, okay? In my policies, we're giving away tomatoes, okay, carrots, all right, cucumbers, all right? For everybody, not just, not just one side, because there's the right, and then there's the left, and then there's everybody in between. You know, there's the right side, then there's the wrong side, and Kamala, she's in over her head. Look at her, look at her, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Uh, I, I wish I could find the full a full show for that one, guys. It's just <laughs> uh, you can't tell me you don't enjoy that, guys. There's so many. There have been so many memes, so many, so much stuff around them. Um, there's so many memes, so many funny videos around uh, the whole Kamala Trump uh, debate, guys. Especially Trump, the embarrassment that guy's done has just been absolutely hilarious. Like you gotta have fun about it, guys, because if you don't, all you're gonna do is just be. <laughs> full of sadness all the time as well which is also why i have um 
a good news video every Sunday at 8 a.m., guys, UK time as well. Always a good news, good vibe story as well. I actually wish, I, I actually kind of, maybe I should do a funny story once a week as well. Maybe I should add that to the channel as well. That would be a lot of fun if you if I had one of that I started doing them as well. Let me know what you guys think. Maybe I'll do a community poll and see what you guys think on something like that. So uh, the next one I've got is a very serious one, actually. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's, it's obviously... Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it speak for itself, really. So it's from, from Al Jazeera. The UN head, uh, head of UN slams the Security Council for failure to end the Gaza, Sudan and Ukraine wars. Antonio Guerrero tells Al Jazeera that the Security Council is outdated, unfair and ineffective. So Antonio, for, we've heard his name quite a few, pop around quite a few times, obviously. Especially around Gaza and the situation in the Middle East. Um, but, you know... These three wars are kind of the biggest, the biggest, con the biggest conflicts I would say in the world right now. Um, Gaza, obviously, the most highlighted. Ukraine, of course, in Europe, and then Sudan, obviously, in Africa. These are the ones that, which I covered extensively on the Snowflake conflict. If you haven't seen that uh, live stream, I do recommend checking it out uh, on them. We did cover a bit of Myanmar as well um, for those uh, who are curious to know about some of the stories going out of there as well. Um, <clears throat> So basically, the Security Council has not been doing enough here. But I, I don't know if it's just a case of the Security Council. I think it's just a case of... For me, it's a case... It's not just a case of, of, of the Security Council. You have Israel, who just will not budge on their decisions and just don't give a damn about international what international organizations have to say. You have Russia, who don't give a damn, who are a... a, 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 a terrorist uh, dictator who is paranoid about nato and its expansion and general and wants to bring back the soviet union uh, as a whole um and he has mass he has ambitions uh, vladimir putin without a shadow of a doubt and then you have the conflict in sudan which at one point looked like there was before the before the conflict exploded they looked like there was actually going to be a elected elected democratic government coming in but two stubborn ass generals which i've talked about many uh, talked about in the past decided to attempt to coup instead and instead go to go to civil war over control of the country and ever since then these two two armies in in sudan have just ripped the country apart and uh, and there appears to be no end in sight for any kind of ceasefire or peace deal in that Af in that african nation and it's really, really shameful that not enough is being done. <coughs> I, I do put a lot of blame on international, some of the most powerful nations on this planet not doing enough to to secure peace here yeah, for them as well. I don't think it, it's not just the case of international organisations, but I also blame uh, nation, some of the most powerful nations, US in particular, for not doing more on these situations. So the United Nations general. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the Security Council is an outdated, unfair, and ineffective system, whose failure to put an end to the Israeli war on Gaza has damaged the credibility of the organization as a whole. Speaking to Al Jazeera Arab in an exclusive interview, the UN chief decried the failures of the council, which was established in the aftermath of World War II, to ensure international peace and security, but whose permanent members' veto powers has consistently proven to be an obstacle in that goal. Hundred percent, the US is permanent. Uh, veto power is something that is completely BS because they are stopping uh, punishment on Israel every single time because uh, because they are their friend and ally when the majority of the world is not happy with what Israel are doing um, yeah 100% on that the Council of Guerrilla says doesn't correspond with the world of today. The truth is, is that the Security Council has systematically failed in relation to the capacity to put an end to the most dramatic conflicts that we face today, Sudan, Gaza and Ukraine. Guterres, a former Prime Minister of Portugal who has at the helm at the UN since 2017, stressed that the organisation's other bodies, particularly its humanitarian agencies, has continued to deliver essential services to Palestinians throughout Israel, more than 11 months' assault on Gaza, but he noted that the Council's political failure to bring an end to the conflict has hurt the UN's other bodies. 
The UN is not the Security Council, Gurria said, but he acknowledged that the UN staff in the field, and particularly those from the UN Relief and Work Agencies for Palestinian Refugees, the UNRWA in Gaza, suffers from the fact that the people look at them and think, well, but the Security Council, well, but the Security Council has failed us. Yeah, and they have suffered severely, the UNRWA. Let's remind ourselves, they have suffered severely um, for this. Israel have done everything they can to... to damage and misrepresent the reputation of the UNRWA on many, many counts as well. For us, this failure of the Security Council is a severe handicap for our work in the field, he added. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Gutierrez noted that the 200 UNRWA staff killed by Israeli forces in Gaza since, he, since the beginning of the war pointed to a recent survey showing reconciliation for the agency's effects among the Palestinians it is reaching. He also expressed relief that the agency has come under attack earlier this year when Israel accused members of its staff of links to terrorism, leading several countries to withhold funding. The agency's credibility appears to have been restored. Many countries that are in the beginning hesitated to suspend the support for the UNRWA have come back helping UNRWA deliver, he said. The UNRWA remains the backbone of humanitarian support to the people of Gaza. Still, he condemns the consistent challenges Israel continues to pose to that work. <clears throat> when conditions are made for them to work, like in relation to polio, they immediately are very effective, Gutierrez said. If the same conditions would be given to our support in relation to other aspects of humanitarian action, if we hadn't had the obstacles, the harassment, the problems, the difficulties that Israel had been systematically creating to the acts of UN humanitarian agencies, in particular to the UN RWA, we'd be able to do much more, and the people uh, do need much more. In the interview, Gunners also blames the world major powers for fostering the culture of impunity on display in Gaza. As he even expressed confidence in the works of the International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court, Gutierrez said, We live in an environment of total impunity. Everyone does what they want, he added. The geopolitical divide that exists among the major powers that's created a situation in which any country or any movement anywhere in the world feels that they can do whatever they want because there will be no punishment and there will be no accountability. This is exactly where Israel are at because they are getting away with so much of what they are doing with no accountability and no punishment for the actions that they are doing within, Ga within Gaza. They must face justice. The Israeli government must face justice of some sorts. And I'm glad that this is being called out very publicly here. Especially Israel. And it's absolutely infuriating that the United States continues to stand by them when they are blatantly, blatantly Israel, breaking international laws here. He also said the United States should put more pressure on Israel to end its assault on Gaza. It's important to put pressure on the US in order to make sure that the United States puts pressure on Israel as they are supporting Israel, put pressure on Israel to stop the war and at the same time recognise that the two-state solution must not be undermined. We've been asking the United States to do much more strong in relation to Israel, he added. Gutierrez also discussed the ongoing expansion of Israeli settlements and outposts in the occupied West Bank, which are illegal under international law. We must absolutely reject any prosperous annexation of the West Bank, he said. The West Bank, together with Gaza and East Jerusalem, which is part of the West Bank, must be the state of Palestine in the future. One of the most concerning things we have present at the moment is the systematic policy of many in the Israeli government trying to undermine the two-state solution. Exactly be uh, evictions, settlements, grabbing land and other actions in the West Bank, which are of course totally against international law, he added. There is an opinion of the International Court of Justice. The opinion is clear. This is an occupation and the occupation is not legal. This is a great piece. Great piece. Uh, um, and I'm... Antonio, uh, bless that man for coming out and calling calling these problems for what they are, calling out the Security Council for its failures, calling out the US for saying they need to be doing more. Well said, well, 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 well said, is what I will say here. Um, and it's, it's difficult for some people to call out Israel, especially on the higher ups there. But considering his position, um, I think that's a really important one there. And uh, I, I hope... Those words echo within Washington and they will take heed of it. I don't think they will. I'd like to think they will, but let's hope they do. And I do hope some of the other Western allies who are backers of Israel and are backers of the US, obviously, can not just obviously they but apply pressure on the US to do more to apply pressure on Israel to do more to push for that ceasefire that everybody needs. Everybody needs. 
Because every day that passes, not only do innocent Palestinians die uh, because of their uh, dis because of their hatred for Hamas and what they did on October the seventh. Not only that, as that every day that passes, the suffering of those there. But every day that passes, Jews, innocent Jewish people, Israelis living outside of the country, who are living in many, many places in the Western world, have been harassed, abused, targeted more than ever before because of their religious beliefs, because of who they are. And some of them who have absolutely no association with the country or the government and what's happening in the Middle East, but they've been targeted and racially discriminated because of what happened, what is happening inside Gaza and the West Bank as well. <clears throat> and I think that needs to be that is another reason why they need to do this not to not just for the sake of protecting lives palestinian lives but also protecting is you they will actually help and protect innocent jews and innocent israelis around the world who are being abused who are being attacked who are being jabbed at who are suffering as a result of the actions by what the government is doing in israel to, uh, under the idf to those in the West Bank and Gaza. More needs to be done. More needs to be done. Another pro a problem, potential crisis that has been facing. So one of the, so before I go to this next one here from the Guardian. So one of the biggest issues uh, that we, I'm sure everybody agrees, is there has been an influx, a great deal of increase of immigration coming from Africa, Middle East in particular, coming into the into Europe, that has obviously created a crisis. Without a shadow of a doubt, that um, many uh, certain politicians of, of political different countries, or shall we call them right wing politicians or groups and political parties, have been able to uh, capitalize on this and use this to gain power and influence within their political uh, nation, within the nations that they are in as well as gaining some influence within the EU Parliament. And this is quite an interesting one here. So the European Union fears for its human rights credibility as Tunisia crushes dissent leaks shows. So documents detailing the uh, deterioration under Khil Saad will fuel concerns about the bloc's migration deal with his country. So for those who don't know, the EU has a, a deal with Tunisia to basically stop migrants from crossing over from their country into Europe. They have, a, they're basically it's a package deal that they they get a lot of money from the EU to say we need you to stop migrants and basically to hold them in in Africa basically to try and stop stop them coming, and obviously as good of a deal as it sounds for uh, for for the EU because obviously as many people in Europe and UK and whatnot want to reduce migration coming into Europe and and the UK and others respectively. I would say Tunisian people are probably not happy about the increase in migration that's happening on their soil. They will obviously be saying, well, we don't want uh, our unlimited migrants in our country either. So then you end up the problem of, well, where do they go? And this, this, I, this will no doubt apply pressure to Kali Saad as well. So, yeah, the credibility. So <laughs> it's a case of passing the buck from trying to pass their problems on to Tunisia, whereas Tunisia now, you know, they don't have unlimited capacity. At some point, they're going to have the, they're going to have problems as well. It's not impossible, but obviously this is obviously coming from Africa. Obviously many people coming from the Middle East, coming through Turkey, and they're going from Turkey, Greece, Hungary, that, that way as well. It's obviously another challenge as well as dealing with mig migration as well. So let's read into this, you guys. So the European Union fears its credibility is at stake as it seeks to weigh growing concerns about the crushing of dissent in, in Tunisia while preserving a controversial migration deal with the North African country according to a leaked document. An internal report drafted by the EU diplomatic service, the EEAS, seen by The Guardian, details a clear deterioration of a political climate and a shrinking civic space under Tunisian President Khalid Saad, who has suspended parliament and concentrated power in his hands since starting his term in office in 2019. EU officials expect Saad to remain in power after presidential elections on October the 6th. The build-up uh, to the vote has been marked by the jailing of opponents and the prosecution of dissenters under the pretext of spreading false misinformation. Uh, and this is the thing. 
the EU are turning a blind eye to this uh, from the looks of it because while I'm sure that the European Union do not like what uh, the president is doing and obviously what's happening in Tunisia, especially when you're uh, jailing your opponent, silencing, uh, suspending parliament and taking full control. I think the fear from the EU is, is that if they allow... The fear from, I think, from the EU is that it is damaging their human rights, uh, rights reputation, because they're allowing this, they're just sitting by and allowing this deal to happen. But at the same time, if hypothetically, right, they had the, they have the election in October, and the Tunisian president loses power, the parliament restored, parliament is restored, new president restored, people get uh, a new president and a change of democratic nation of some sort let's just say hypothetically that was to happen in tunisia right well the the chances are they will probably say to the eu no we're not gonna like they're gonna demand more money or for from the eu to have to keep holding on to to stopping migrants they'll be off they would want more money or they could turn around and say no we're not going to deal with it anymore because we don't want to have hold all these migrants coming who want to go to europe it's, it's not entirely impossible um, it's entirely possible that that could be a case as well. So <clears throat> it is a very delicate situation and not a very good one as well uh, for the EU to be in. The document will fuel concerns about the 2023 EU Tunisia Migration Pact aimed at stopping people from reaching Europe from the country, which has already triggered accusation of bankrolling dictators. EU Tunisia relations have become more complex, concludes the document which the EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, sent to the blog's foreign ministry on July the 7th. The EU continues to have a keen interest in preserving its partnership with Tunisia in order to ensure the country's stability, the report continues. Describing this tie as a means to ensure social, economic stability, respect for human rights and continued efforts, cooperation on migration management. Excuse me. The EU fears that without such support, Tunisia will fall under the influence of hostile third countries, which, although they are not named, almost certainly refers to competitors like Russia, China, Iran. And that would be very bad. That would be very, very bad, um, especially from a migration point, because obviously lots of migrants from Africa um, would be allowed to freely, uh, well, I wouldn't say freely, but we'll probably get, uh, have to pay traffickers and all that kind of stuff to go to Europe from there. But it would be... Uh, would not be in the EU's interest if Tunisia was to be influenced by Russia, China, or Iran. Report uh, so so if if this is what could be down the road. <coughs> and the report lays bare that the fears of a parole team and that EU's credibility could suffer the blog seek to wake human rights with curbing migration and pursuing broader ties. This will entail shrinking an increasing difficult balance between the EU's credibility in terms of values and its interest in staying constructively engaged with the Tunisian authorities, it notes. The five-page report recounts the arrest of opposition politicians, journalists, lawmakers and business people before next month's presidential election. Also, arrests have been working uh, with four NGOs that help migrants, the majority of which are implementing partners of the EU-funded programme, the EU documents note. And since the EU report was written, more people have been detained, including the veterans, human rights activists and journalists, Shadim uh, Bastin, the former president of the Truth and Dignity Commission, which was set up after the Arab Spring to investigate decades of human rights abu abuses. She was ordered into a pre-trial detention on the 1st of August after an investigation widely considered to have been based on trumped-up charges, basically made up. Before her arrest, Brajin had spoken out against political repression and the poisonous atmosphere in Tunisia after saying racist tirades against migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. The EEAS reported notes that the public outcry and scrutiny about violence, evictions, and other mistreatment of migrants and asylum seekers in which the authorities often implemented raises critical questions about EU support to border management authorities. The report was commissioned by Royale and sent to 27 EU foreign ministers. The Guardian shared a copy with the Hassim Bossi at Amnesty International, who said its analysts reflected a very dire situation. There is no hiding from the reality that the situation in Tunisia in terms of human rights and democratic backsliding is very worrying. The final part of the report, however, is like it was written by a completely different person who had not read the earlier page, he said. It is saying that the EU must continue to engage more with Tunisian authorities, continue to expand cooperation, to expand their partnership, even though it was very clearly aware that it would be in violation of the EU's commitments through promising human rights to international law 
and rule of law. So a part of this <coughs> piece here, someone who's basically, according to the report, obviously a part of it is basically saying, who cares about all this? We have to continue the relationship regardless. We don't want migrants in Europe. This is basically the premise of what it sounds like there. By expanding cooperation with Tunisia in order for international migration control, he said the EU has given quite some leverage to Tunisia. Hulun Bormann, a veteran Social Democrat MEP, said the political and human situ rights situation in Tunisia was worrisome now. It had been worrisome when the Memorandum of Understanding was signed. The European Commission has granted the EU taxpayer money to an authoritarian regime. Tries to restrict all opposition through inhuman methods. He said the EU promised 105 million euros to Tunisia in 2023 to fight people smugglers expanding an existing multi-million euro border control fund. The Tunisian government later said it had handed back 60 million euros to Brussels. The Commission the Bowman added should investigate the human rights situation of a country before undertaking any foreign policy. The Commission has been contacted for comment. Hmm. This is a very interesting situation to say the least, guys. Very interesting to say the least. Fa a fascinating piece as well because it is a it is a great a dilemma that the e European Union has has to deal with here. The very of because of what Tunisia because of where they are geography wise, they kind of need them. While at the same time, you know they don't obviously value what what this president Kadi San is kind of doing as well, which is totally understandable. While also at the same time, it's like, well, they kind of need them to stop migrants coming into Europe. And it's just like, what are they supposed to do here? The EU. It's a very difficult situation because if, if they didn't have this deal with Tunisia, there would be a much bigger flood of migrants coming into Europe. A lot bigger. I mean, there are still migrants coming. There's no question about that. They're still going to come regardless. But... It would be a lot. It would be a lot more. I would say probably, especially when you have so many conflicts taking place in Africa, not just Sudan, but in other African nations as well. So many flee and head towards the likes of Egypt and Tunisia, up there, and then try to get try to flee from there into Europe, looking for smugglers that will take them on boats across in the Mediterranean. It's a tough situation, that is for sure, guys. <coughs> Guys, just before I go to my next piece, if you haven't hit the like button and shared or subscribed, if you've done all those things, which I greatly appreciate, if you want to go one step further and financially support me in the work that I do here, you can do so by leaving a super chat uh, down below, or you can join the memberships for, for 99p. Being a 99p member gives you access to custom emojis, and also when it gives you access to community posts, and soon it will also give you guys act early access to some of my content as well. Um, I would advise people not to subscribe any any longer to the 299 membership. That will be ending soon, just for those uh, wondering. But if you want other ways of financial support me in the work that I do, you can buy me a coffee. A link is in the description. There is also a PayPal option as well that is also linked. Uh, if it's not in the description, it should be linked uh, elsewhere as well. At Regan Elite Business, I have a PayPal if you want to uh, donate that way. The other ways you want to support me is via Patreon as well. On the Patreon, not only when you pay into that, you don't just pay into a blank page you actually get lots of content on their paid members non-paid members get lots of content on the patreon community on the patreon so if you have a patreon account you can just follow me and you get extra content on there as well so if you like what i do here on the youtube channel you'll like what uh, goes on on the patreon as well and also there's a rumble channel that also covers stuff in the middle east as well you can check that out as well links for all those are in the description so thank you to anyone and everyone who has supported me in any way shape or form financially or not financially it is all greatly appreciated so a nice a nice a nice good story here for you guys a sort of good story um here i wanted to share this one because i thought this was a, a, a nice a nice one guys and i think we need we need some um a nice stories especially with all these things <coughs> this is from cnn so a runaway penguin spent two weeks missing at sea the typhoon may have saved her what what is this story about regan oh let me explain uh, hold on, let me, the, this is not, uh, let me fix that, there we go. So, a runaway penguin has been found safe in Japan nearly two weeks after she first went missing, and having paddled 45 kilometers, that's 28 miles, during a typhoon in a survival story her people called Miraculous. The six-year-old Cape Penguin, who goes by the name Pen, and was born and raised in captivity, was swimming with staff uh, from the travelling Gigas and Pentasu at a beach in central Japan's 
uh, Himakananiska Island on the 25th of August when she escaped. Penkeeper Roscoe Emery had told CNN. And then you can see Penn's first time swimming in the ocean was at the beach when she escaped there. So it's a very, so you can see it's very, very, looks very, very happy there and the waters are very calm. <laughs> While taking a dip in the ocean to avoid heat stroke, Penn suddenly became agitated and swam through a hole in her enclosure out into open waters. Her escape left Imre racked with worry and guilt. African penguins can swim up to 40 kilometers, 25 miles a day, he said. But in captivity, their muscle mass decreases. Penn had never swum in the sea before visiting the beach. I couldn't help but feel despair, Emery had told CNN. The chances of her surviving in the wild were very, very low. Pen on the left there, standing alongside her partner Gan there. So, got a partner as well. A lucky break would have kept Pen safe. A powerful typhoon called Shadashing brought high winds and torrential rain to the country and at the end of August, killing at least six people, displacing millions, knocking out power and disrupting air travel. But amid the destruction, the typhoon was a boon for little Pen, Imri said. With no boats able to operate, Pen avoided collisions and getting caught in fishing nets. The record rainfall provided a reliable source of hydration and cooling. She survived because of the typhoon, Imri said. It was the most miraculous thing. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, this little clip here. Penn's keeper, Roscoe Emery, uh, rescued Penn after someone spotted her on a beach 45 kilometers from where she escaped. Which is quite uh, a miraculous thing indeed there to see. Um, yeah, that's quite uh, quite a miraculous to, to to have seen because of the typhoon gilling penders wasn't initially able to send out rescue boats to search for pen it was even more surprising when on sunday someone spotted her swimming near a beach about eight miles from where she first went missing it was 10 minutes from the facility where she usually lived so the penguin didn't leave go too far from the facility because it was probably scared being out on its own when we first received the report i couldn't believe it was really a penguin emory said it was a huge relief Penn had no injuries and was in good physical shape. She also passed substantial droppings, Emery said, which meant she must have found something to snack during her journey, like fish or crab. Uh, house guests, though Penn had never eaten live fish before. Emery spoke to CNN and he said Penn was sleeping very comfortably next to me. He added, it's nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, yeah without a shadow of a doubt. Um, what a fascinating story for, for, the, <laughs> for the penguin. <laughs> Um, absolute um, fascinating story to say the least that, that a typhoon actually may have inadvertently saved Penn's life um, obviously the typhoon at the time obviously without a shadow of a doubt is dangerous destructive and and has caused harm to many human lives as well as other animals I'm sure yeah when it comes through but in, a, in an odd sort of way it's also helped this penguin and it's saved it and I'm pretty sure if it was out there on its own, it may not have survived, guys. It may not have survived. We don't know for sure, for sure if the typhoon hadn't come along, would it have saved Penn? But um, I thought this was a nice little story to add, yeah, given some of the stories that we have. But uh, yeah, Penn the, Pen the penguin is uh, hap happily back here yeah, with, with, with their keepers, that's for sure, guys. <clears throat> uh, so this uh, last story I've got for you guys. Uh, let me make sure I've got it on the right one. There we go. This last story I've got for you guys is from the Financial Times. It's more obviously on climate and as well the continuous wildfires that continue to happen across the globe and a reminder that that we still have an issue. So wildfire sweep Amazon, uh, the Amazon forest as Brazil suffers its worst drought on record. Destruction of the forest combined with low rainfall exaggerates efforts of climate change. So obviously um, Brazil that has suffered immensely the amazon rainforest has suffered immensely obviously and that is one of our biggest supplies of um that takes in the biggest world supply of co um takes in a lot of co2 on behalf of the planet and it is really really important that the amazon is well looked after and protected the last brazilian president uh Basuano wanted to obviously uh chop as much of that down for sake of more farming and community and um <clears throat> as uh, the climate continues to get as the climate and the planet continues to get warmer obviously rainfall in certain areas become less or certain climates become more colder and warmer as a result of some of the actions but overall the planet is actually getting warmer um and uh yeah any any fire forest is obviously it's an, it's an extremely difficult task especially ones that get out of control and you're going to see a picture just how big and out of control this gets guys more, more needs to be done, of course, when it comes to climate, that is for sure. 
not just what here in the UK, but all nations as well. So Brazil is fighting wildfires that have cast smoke across swathes of its territory, fueled by heat waves of the nation's worst drought on record. Another record breaking, guys. The areas of the Amazon in Brazil, home to about two thirds of the world's largest rainforest, suffered its highest number of blaze for 14 years in August, according to a national space research agency, MP. Uh, other biomes scorched by flames, including the vast tropical savanna called the Sorico that stretches across the centre of the country and the Panorama wetlands in the south. The total area burnt this year in Brazil is estimated at 34.5 millimetres acres, or about the size of Germany. More than double the average of the same period across the 2012-2023, according to the Global Wildfire Information System. A joint comprehensive and NASA initiative that uses thermal analytics detected by satellite to assess the burnt area. So I can't play the clip here, but um, pretty much that the blue there is obviously where more, most of the smoke is being. It's uh, being, being there, but um, that's the imagery they, they have there. While elevated temperatures of more than 40 degrees in some places have combined with the prolonged dry spells to turn delicate ecosystems into tinderboxes, authorities have blamed human action for lighting the spark in many cases. They singled out slash and burn agriculture practices for some farmers and ranchers as well as criminals looking for clear forested lands. Though fires on a small scale form part of the national ecological cycle from Cilado and Panoral, the intensity of this year's burning season has caused serious harm. The government of President uh, Luis Lingjo Lida da Silva, which has made environmental protections a priority, is sending extra resources to the most affected regions. Despite a fall in Amazon deforestation under Lua, decades of destruction have contributed to the drought and infernos, according to geologist and climatologist Pedro Cortes, a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. The consequences of deforestation of the Amazon that has been that the replenishment of water and humidity in the atmosphere has been reduced, he said. This result in diminished rainfall from flying, uh, flying rivers or clouds that form the Amazon bastion and transport water vapour to other parts of South America, Cortes explained. Scientists say global warming is also playing a role in the methodological phenomena affecting Brazil. The evidence is clear that climate change is both contributing to the exaggerations of these crises, said Isabel Tectia, a biologist and, and Brazil's former environment minister. We know that Brazil is much more likely to experience even more of these extreme weather events as climate change further intensifies. Smoker shroud skies as part of South America as part of a result of fire spreading across countries including in Peru and Bolivia. Bolivia declared a national emergency last week because of its largest number of forest fires since 2010, according to IMSOL, in the capital La Paz, and many schools are closed as classes went online. Brazil's drought began in mid-2023 and has been described as the most intense and widespread in its history by the National Centre of National Disaster Monitoring and Alerts. Cameron, the Environment Agency, said almost 60% of Latin America's largest nations affected by some degree. Last year, one factor was El Nino, the naturally occurred weather pattern that warms the Pacific Ocean, said Anna Paula uh, Kana, a researcher at Clemson. This year, there is an even bigger contribution to the overheated North Atlantic, she added. Rain may offer relief in central, uh, central south of the country for next week, said uh, Kenya, but below average participation forecast for the next three months and other states is already facing critical situation. Many waterways in the Amazon based on untouched historic lows, completing base supplies for distant communities depending on river, uh, riverine transport, and elsewhere as crop ranges for coffee to oranges have been harmed. A dry spell also regulates regulators to increase energy bills because of the backbone of Brazil's power generation is from hydroelectric dams and reservoir levels have dropped. There is also an impact on human wealth. Health uh, wildfires have carried dangerously micro, particularly in matters, blanket both countryside and urban centres in muggy clouds. And on Thursday, the smoke plums reaching out about 33% of national territory, with roughly 11% of Brazil exposed to heavy smoke, according to the Financial Times calculations based on data from the Capesas Atmosphere Monitoring Services. São Paulo, Brazil's most populous uh, multinacional had the worst air quality in the, of 120 major cities worldwide this week, according to the Swiss data platform IG, IQ Air. And it found that the country's western Amazon region was the most polluted area in the world last month because of wildfires. This is really bad. The scale of the emissions has grown to historic levels through August until now, around the typical peak season, with well above uh, average emissions, said Mark Pannington, senior scientist at Cobasinus. 
He said that some regions, including Bolivia, Amariscus and Mado Grau de Sol, were at or around the highest level of total fire emissions over the 22 years covered by the EU's agency data set. Fires across South America this year have emitted 72% more carbon dioxide this year than the average for the same period in 2012-2023, according to the GWIS. This scenario will fuel climate change even more, said Marcelia Asli, Executive Secretary at the Nonprofit Climate Observatory. We need more forceful action. This is the moment to increase punishment and environment crimes in Brazil, especially those linked to fire and deforestation. Absolutely. <clears throat> those responsible need to face more crimes. They def those responsible for causing these fires need to face more harsher, part harsher crimes towards them, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, they, ne they need to face more 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 harm and punishment for it because too many people are suffering as a result of it the, the the climate is getting warmer the planet is getting warmer and we need to reduce our co2 emissions and we still have people thinking that it's okay to start fires on that on that level now there needs to be harsher punishments for people who who start arsons the the punishment for arsons need to be harsher much 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 harsher i hope more is done about it. I really hope so, guys. Um, um, they need the, the rain. The rain. The Amazon rainforest needs to be protected. It really, really does. And I and I hope and I hope I hope the Brazilian president uh, can can get a grip on it. I really hope he can. So, guys, before I end, I thought I'd give you guys one more funny video before we end the end of the show here on Wells News Round. Because why not end on a more positive note? Because yeah, I, I want to give you guys one more funny video. This is a really funny one. I hope you guys like this one here. Uh, this cat here um, has made it very clear that this cat is not a fan of Donald Trump. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dog, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, <laughs> they're eating the pets of the people that... <laughs> That cat is not a fan of Donald Trump. Not a fan whatsoever. And it made its feelings, feline feelings very, very clear in that. How dare you talk about my my species like that? <laughs> oh, I had to give you guys that. I had to give you guys that. <sighs> so, guys, we come to the end of the world's news round. What do you guys think of some of the stories that we covered today? We covered quite a lot. We talked about Arizona's uh, 1864 uh, uh Abortion ban being officially off the books. Russia producing kamikaze drones with Chinese engines. We talked about uh, people in Congo being handed down death sentences uh, as well. We also talked about uh, the Security Council's failures to end the Gaza, Sudan, Ukraine wars from Al Jazeera. The EU's crisis with Tunisia, I think, was very in as another interesting one there as well. Talked about the runaway penguin, which I know you guys really, really liked. And then finally, obviously, we talked about the wildfires in the Amazon in Brazil. Let me know your thoughts and more about all these stories down in the comments below what you guys thought. It would be greatly appreciated. But before you guys head out, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate Share this across social media so others are not fired of this video. And subscribe if you haven't, because it really does help support the channel. And if you want to go one step further, financially support me and the work that I do here, you can do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p. Or join me on Rumble or Patreon for exclusive content on those platforms. So thank you all so much for watching and I hope to catch you all very, very soon.